And we're really thrilled to have uh, Zsuzsa Gille, uh, Professor of Sociology and Director of Global Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, to open that mini-series of lectures on environmental issues. Professor Zsuzsa Gille is um, uh, work is at the intersection of transnational sociology with a focus on the European Union and post-socialist countries, environmental sociology, and the sociology of consumption. She's the author of Paprika, Foie Gras, and Red Mud, The Politics of Materiality in the European Union, published in 2016. Um, she's also the author of uh, the award-winning book, From the Cult of Waste to the Trash Heap of History, The Politics of Waste in Socialist and Post-Socialist Hungary in 2007, and both books were published uh, from Indiana University Press. And she also co-authored Global Ethnography, Forces, Connections, and Imagination in, post in, in a Postmodern World, uh, published by um, California in two 2000, and co-edited I mean, it's a long list of publications, and I'm just keeping it to the books. She also co-edited the volume Post-Communist Nostalgia in 2010, and um, a new book that's coming out with Indiana in a few months, uh, entitled The Socialist Good Life, Desire, Development, and Standards of Living in Eastern Europe. Uh, so prolific author, fellow sociologist, I'm actually especially happy that we open with a sociologist. Please welcome uh, warmly uh, Zsuzsa Gille for her lecture, Nature, Consumption, and Waste in the Cold War and Beyond. Thank you so much for that um, introduction. I'm really grateful to be here, happy to be back in fact. Um, what I'm going to present today is um, not necessarily the results of a new research project, rather um, returning to some of my earlier work and putting them together indifferently in part to answer um, a new uh, set of research questions that have arisen around the concept of the Anthropocene. Um, you can see the outline of my talk here. I'm going to talk about state socialism's relationship with the natural environment. I will present some critiques of those views. Then I'm going to talk about what so state socialism, if anything, had to do with the Anthropocene. I'm going to talk about the four chiefs, Jason Moore's concept, applying a relational perspective to his concept of the capitalism. And finally, I will present a case study that might um, illustrate what this relational perspective on the Anthropocene might mean. So just starting out with some of the things that probably um, most of you are aware of, the ways in which we have represented state socialist countries' relationship with the natural environment. Um, there is the big picture, which you could probably see from a Frankfurt School perspective, but not only from the critical theory perspective, the idea that State socialism was a modern society. It had to modernize. And Marxism itself, you know, theoretically speaking, is part and parcel of the Enlightenment project. So there's this prerogative of the domination of nature in state socialism, just like in capitalism. Of course, historical circumstances made that even more necessary. And I'm not just talking about the post-war ruins, whether we talk about you know, the birth of the Soviet Union or the birth of communism in Eastern Europe after the Second World War, but also later on the Cold War, which meant not just embargoes. Is this okay now? Sorry. <laughs> Have you guys not heard a word I just said? We do for the recording. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, um, so the Cold War, of course, also meant, you know, uh, the arms race, all of which necessitated an emphasis on heavy industry and less of a concern about what's going to happen to the environment as a result. When we talk about the uses of nature, another familiar um, claim is utilitarianism, the idea that we don't want waste, uh, we don't want nature to go to waste. Let's make the most of it. 
Then, you know, you have the Marxist idiocy of rural life type of attitude, which was partially necessary in the transition from an agrarian society, which many of these societies were prior to communism, to an industrialized society. But it was also necessitated for political reasons, namely the breakup of peasant majorities, especially in the countryside. On the other hand, if you look at urban planning and regional planning in state socialist countries, you also see an emphasis on green spaces, all of which were collective, of course, and the appropriate uses of nature in one's free time, all of which was part of this disciplining project and the creation of Homo Sovieticus. And finally, there's a kind of philosophical orientation that I'm going to talk more about. Um, if you will, I would call this dialectics on the cube or dialectics carried to the extreme. It's a kind of extreme social constructivism um, that stated and assumed and put in practice the idea that there are no real limits in nature or in physical reality, and I'm going to come back to that. So I'm just going to present you with a few images that summarize some of these um, presumptions, assumptions that we have about state socialism's relationship to nature. The first image there, um, you see the, you know, it, this is not just about the industrialization of agriculture, but also that agriculture is subordinated to industry. In the second one, the headline says, um, coal is the bread of industry, right? So this metaphor again signals that industry is the new uh, key thing here, which is just a very plain um, call to innovation, is again about innovation being equated with uh, the transformation of nature. At the same time, you have various campaigns for greening, a call for young communists to um, plant trees, and then of course, uh, later on from the 60s, this emphasis on you know, healthy lifestyles, getting out in nature and move. And there's also, of course, the emphasis on providing um, meaningful free time, vacation time out in nature. And of course, what you see in all of these images is, is a fairly harmonious uh, coexistence of people um, with nature. On a somewhat different note, and in the urban and in the industrial context itself, of course, you see campaigns for against littering, which was especially strong in the Stalinist um, period. Then you have various calls for thriftiness, and then uh, cutting down on rejects in the context of industrial production, some of which I'm going to um, talk about. And then there's this image. And, and of course, you've seen images like this. I think it's paradigmatic, and it uh, says a lot that this was published in 1990, so just after communism collapsed. This was a Sunday magazine special issue on environmental problems in Eastern Europe. This is a picture taken from um, Romania. And um, I'm not sure how well you can see it. I mean, obviously, you see the smog, smog the typical kind of industrial pollution, uh, the chimney. And I think as many pictures, this too tells a thousand words. And I think the story this picture is telling, and I think this is still the dominant um, narrative we have about Eastern Europe's relationship with nature, is that this, is, this environmental record is not just because of industrialization, electrification, et cetera. But if you look down in the lower registers of the picture, you see dilapidated buildings, a lot of um, clutter, ruins, trash. Um, basically arguing that backwardness and poverty are both to blame for the poor environmental record of Eastern Europe. Indeed, this picture very well represents what I would call the equilibrial understanding of environmental destruction in state socialism, backwardness, uh, the idea that old technologies are necessarily dirtier than new ones because they um, work with low efficiency, so they use more material, more energy, they emit more um, contamination. That's the political argument of this liberal narrative, namely that because the state owned everything, um, the state had no interest in regulating itself, for example, in terms of environmental policy. Um, of course, the lack of private property meant, according to liberals, that there was no incentive um, uh, to treat nature with greater care, 
or respect, and the lack of market incentive and lack of competition again uh, led to inefficiencies. The political final aspect of this liberal narrative is that due to censorship um, and due to lack of democracy, no real environmental movement was um, possible. Now what is the problem with this view? What does it assume? It kind of assumes that if you, whoops, I'm sorry, that if you didn't have backwardness, if you were highly technologically developed, if you had market and private property, and if you had democracy, you wouldn't have any environmental problems at all. Now, last time I checked, capitalism could check all these boxes and it's not like it had such a great record either, right? So what I tried to get away from in my early work with this, with this false comparison, the idea that everything that socialism lacked that was the good things of Western capitalism was what was at fault for its environmental record. And in contradistinction to this narrative, I tried to look at state socialism as, as a sui generis society, understanding what unique, peculiar logics and relationships in state socialism led to environmental destruction. I'm going to then jump to this concept of the Anthropocene, which I'm sure has shown up on your radar, even if you're not dealing with environmental issues. And uh, not to insult your intelligence, just a little recap that this basically refers to a new geological age following the, um, the Holocene, um, basically arguing that humanity has transformed Earth's ecology to such an extent <laughs> that that is now evident in its morphology, trace elements, loss of biodiversity, and um, fossil records. There are a lot of debates about when the Anthropocene started. The earliest one would place it at 10,000 years or 11,000 when they first started farming. Um, I think the most common dating is that it starts with coal and steam becoming <coughs> dominant. And then the most recent 2015 argument uh, argues that it's, it's the great acceleration of uh, post-war uh, country, uh, post-war uh, economic development that is really when, when things got out of um, control. Now, it, we're talking about thousands of years here, so does it even make sense to ask what is the relationship of state socialism as it existed for 74 and then um, uh, 44 years respectively in Soviet Union and Eastern Europe? After all, that's just a blip in the history of these thousands and tens thousands of years. Um, I mean, I think it's important to, to remember that not including the state socialist experience when at its peak, a third of the world's population lived under some kind of socialist government is a kind of uh, arrogance uh, in itself. And I think especially when we identify the Anthropocene with this great acceleration, the post-war period, I think then it's especially incumbent upon us to talk about state socialism. So one thing that you can ask, and you often see you know, the typical kind of comparativist impulse, is to ask what would have been different had it not been for state socialism. Did, uh, this, did say socialism make a difference for the Anthropocene? I can identify four possible answers. One is that state socialism made no difference for humanity's overall impact for nature. One perspective from which you can make this is world system perspective, and here the argument goes that because state socialist countries were part and parcel of the world capitalist system, the capitalist world system, they were mostly semi-peripheral, they just contributed as any other semi-peripheral country, whether they were communist or socialist in the world system. So their existence made no difference for how capitalism uh, treated nature. The second one argues that state socialism led to greater destruction and the greater alteration of the biosphere than capitalism alone would have because of the state socialist mode of production, central planning, state ownership, the things that I have already mentioned, and the ideological uh, imperatives of heavy industrialization 
Then you have the eco-socialist argument, which you don't find around much, but it, it was existent in the early 1990s that argued that state socialism actually created a break. If you will, it slowed down uh, environmental destruction because if in these societies capitalism had remained, then they would have engaged in mass consumption, um, having the, uh, industrialization and modernization to a degree that they did not. So in a way here, backwardness is a virtue and the lack of mass consumerism is a virtue. And finally, and this is already a little bit closer to what I will call a relational perspective, there's an argument that could be made that it's not so much that state socialism was more destructive or contributed more to the Anthropocene, but rather that in its relationship with Western capitalism, it had a negative effect on the natural environment. And that's because from the perspective of Western capitalism, state socialism was a geopolitical ideological foe. And you could argue that the arms race and then the constant ratcheting up of consumption meant a greater burden on nature, greater exhaustion of natural resources and greater contamination. So here it's not so much that state socialism in itself impacted the natural environment negatively, but because it existed, capitalism was kind of forced and compelled to ratchet up its use and domination of nature. You with me so far? Good. All right. So then let me talk about this world system slash Marxist critique of the concept of the Anthropocene. And I'm going to refer here to uh, the geographer Jason Moore, Moore's concept of the Capitalocene. He argued that it's faulty to use the term Anthropocene because anthro in that term means that humanity as a whole is responsible for all the destruction, all the radical alterations that we um, imposed on Earth, when in fact, according to him, very simply, this is just about capitalism. So what he argues is the reason why capitalism could bring about these radical changes that Anthropocene advocates identify, um, especially those who date it from uh, coal and steam, was that they could get four things very cheaply, four key resources, food, labor, energy, and raw materials. Now cheap doesn't mean that, that it's not the price that you pay on the market. What he means by cheap is that the cost of reproduction and maintenance of these four resources were never paid by capitalism. One of the reasons why it could do that according to Jason Moore is because of colonization, right? It could outsource all the costs of reproduction to the societies from which it took these resources uh, very cheaply. So you can see that this is an extension of the Marxist argument um, about um, economic uh, exploitation and surplus expropriation. Just as an aside, if we take Jason's Moore argument seriously, and I must say I'm convinced by it. I have one point of contention with him that I'm going to get to in a second. Remember what I said about this comparison of the efficiency of market societies and central planning? Now, if, if it's true that capitalism never really accounted, as Jason Moore says, kept of the book the expenses of repair and maintenance and reproduction of these resources, then could we really say that it was more efficient than central planning? Right. So just um, hold on to that um, thought. So the question arises, did state socialism also pursue these four cheaps? Um, one way, of course, in which state socialism would pursue cheaps is not so much through prices, but through what you know, Marxists call the reduction of socially necessary labor time. And two examples that are already well covered in the scholarship are Stanovism and Lysenkoism, and I'm just going to quickly go over them for those of you who are not that familiar. Lysenko was a Soviet quote-unquote scientist, uh, 
favorite of uh, Stalin, who was very much against genetics and biological determinism. And he argued that the environment can change um, species. So for example, if you plant wheat in a cold climate, it will produce rye. Of course, that wasn't true. And this had quite disastrous consequences, as many other countries in their Stalinist period tried to experiment with, for example, in Hungary, planting tropical um, species in moderate climates. In Hungary, the most famous one is planting orange, lemon, cotton, tea, and rubber. And now we have wonderful um, historical treatises of these, uh, of these experiments. Of course, all of these failed. So this would be one way in which um, state socialism tried to get at resources that otherwise it would have had to pay hard currency for. Um, then the other one is Stahanovism. Um, that might be more familiar. Stahanovites were those class conscious workers who constantly over fulfilled their quota. What you see there on the first image are the kind of percentages that people would pledge by which they over fulfilled the quotas and then you know the actual achievement. Um, and we have this in the wonderful movie, um, Men of Marble, um, a Polish movie. Um, so could state socialism really pursue the four chiefs to the extent and in the way that capitalism did according to um, Jason Moore? Well, there could be some other examples, and I'm just signaling this would be one interesting research question um, uh, for scholars. But overall, the, um, the message of all of these efforts, however unsuccessful and retroactively ridiculous they look, they send a message that the human body and nature are infinitely pliable, right? This is what I earlier referred to as the extreme social uh, constructivism. With sociological lingo, we could say that the functional equivalent of capitalism's goal orientation of ch chasing cheap nature was state socialism chasing, if not pushing, the outer limits of physical and biological reality. And as I mentioned, both had serious um, uh, limits and unintended consequences uh, for uh, the quality and quantity of goods and health um, and the environment. But ultimately, I would argue that state socialism was not able to pursue the four chips in the way that capitalism did. This was primarily because it couldn't outsource production through colonization, which doesn't mean that state socialist countries didn't try colonizing um, various uh, countries, whether that's internal colonization, for example, in Central Asia or external one with various um, Asian and African countries, but ultimately I think these were not as successful. Another reason why it couldn't quite outsource and cheapen key resources is because uh, the social costs of human illness or environmental damage ultimately had to be paid by the state. So it couldn't be private, it couldn't be socialized like in capitalism, right? The private the profits are privatized the expenses and the environmental costs are socialized, right? So because it was state-owned economy, no private property, this was not possible. And just as an aside, I wonder if this could be an explanation, a kind of deeper understanding of why state socialism ultimately collapsed, because it could not do this kind of outsourcing, this kind of cheapening that capitalism was able to do for centuries. So, so much about um, this kind of large view, uh, from above view, bird's eye view of the society nature relationship in state socialism. But I would argue that, especially as an ethnographer, I'm interested in a more substantive description of this relationship. And what that means for me is looking at practices of consumption and practices of wasting. So let me talk first a little bit about consumption. Uh, and this is where I'm going to rely on some of the arguments we make in this book that's going to come out early next year, The Socialist Good Life that I edited with my former 
um, uh, students, um, where we argue against uh, the typical uh, definition of consumption as basically consisting of shopping, i.e. individual acts of um, purchase. And instead, we try to talk about consumption relationally in the sense that we don't separate the sphere of consumption from production and see how these were actually secured with uh, interesting consequences for political subjectivity formation in state socialism. We also take a broad view of consumption, not just focusing on individual, but also on collective consumption. And um, some statistics that I found in Hungary, for example, towards the end of the 1960s, um, about a third of um, human needs, or if you will, income was coming not from salaries, but from the, st uh, the state providing various services, healthcare, schools, culture, vacation, and a bunch of uh, other things that we put in the category of collective consumption. And another thing that we try to do in the book, and I'm only going to be able to refer to it very briefly today, is that if we approach consumption not just as something that's social and cultural and economic, but also something that has a particular effect and relationship and conditioning for and by the non-human world, then I think that's another interesting venue we can investigate. As we're investigating this relational concept of consumption, especially now also bringing in the relationality of capitalism with socialism, we can also ask, OK, Eastern Europe, state socialist countries destroy the natural environment <coughs> just as much, if not more so, than Western capitalist countries. If we grant you that that is a valid question to ask, then we could still ask the question, what bang for the buck did you get in Eastern European state socialist countries? Um, did you get more need satisfaction? Did you feed more mouse, so to speak, with the same amount of destruction that you did in capitalism? Economists so far has, have focused on the smaller bang for the buck, arguing that the material and energy intensity of socialist goods were much higher than their um, uh, counterparts in uh, Western capitalism, for example, they compared the weights of a Soviet and a, and a American tractor, finding that the Soviet tractor was way heavier, had way worse mileage. So these kinds of statistical arguments uh, are what constitute this argument about high material intensity. If we take our perspective that perspective of this relational and broader concept of consumption, we could actually make the opposite argument that in Eastern Europe you got a bigger buck, bigger bang for the buck, sorry, um, because of uh, more of those resources also got channeled into public consumption rather than diverted for um, luxury consumption, exploitation, and all those other things that in capitalism they tend to be. But I'm just putting this out there as, as something that would be another interesting uh, research question to answer. So then returning to Jason Moore, as I think I argued and hopefully you're convinced, his concept of the capitalist scene is quintessentially relational, right? He's not just making a, an argument about capitalism, but he's making an argument about capitalism and its relationship with its colonies. Now, whenever it comes to the question in Jason more about what about the second world, the former socialist countries, he gets this very defensive position and assumes that what proponents of just even mentioning the second world or in this concept of capitalism and means that we give a pass to Eastern Europe. We give a pass to central planning. And as hopefully by now you can tell, that's not what I'm interested in. Um, and I think what uh, motivates my inquiry in, this, uh, in making the capital scene concept even more relational, including the Second World War in his concept of the capital scene, is my dear colleague, Yubi Botnar at CU, who identified what she calls the socialism package error. Here's how she defines it. 
everything that looked different in, state, in the state socialist part of the world could be accounted for by socialism. Differences came in a package, difficult to disentangle. Life was less glittery in the socialist part of the world, not because it had been so even before, in great part due to the cemetery for opposition of these countries in the world system, but because of socialism and consequently the lack of free markets, right? So what she's talking about is how we don't disentangle what of the problems that we attribute to central planning and state socialism were the result of their position in the world system, or which of them were attributable to ideology and the peculiar economic system. So inspired by that, I would like to uh, present this hypothesis that state socialism was yet another site to which capitalism could outsource uh, some of its needs. I'm going to primarily focus not so much on the resources that Jason Moore focuses on, food, labor, energy, and raw materials, but on waste, and that's something that Jason Moore doesn't talk about at all. I'm going to jump over my kind of epistemological justification for this. I'm happy to come back to that in the Q&A, and instead talk about the advantages and uh, uh, the merits of this waste-centered perspective. I'm actually not the first one to argue that we should put waste in the center of our arguments about the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene. A uh, couple of authors even came up with this clunky concept of wasteocene. Um, but so what is waste? Um, it, just very broadly, um, waste is material that we failed to use, that did not, it's material that didn't end up satisfying human needs for one reason or another. And this is where we have to put a corrective to Jason Moore, because for him, with his focus on the four chiefs, he still focuses on value. And I think it's important to recognize that the economy is not just a sphere, where value begets value, but it's also a sphere of activity where value begets waste, waste begets waste, and waste can even beget value, right? So it's a much more complicated set of material practices and transformation that we tend to assume. So the advantages of this waste-centered way of looking at the Anthropocene and the Capitalocene is that it unites both forms of environmental destruction that the American environmental sociologist Ellen Schneeberg identified, treating nature as a sink, right? When you dump things in the landfill, when you emit um, pollutants in the air or in the water, or treating it as a tap, i.e. taking things out of the earth, using uh, resources, withdrawing things from nature. Um, waste does both because waste is not just something that is added to nature, but as I said, it also uses up resources with no corresponding satisfaction of human needs. So it unites both of these. Um, waste can also be seen as a hybrid uh, category. It's both material, but of course no material is born a waste, right? So when we say waste material, really what we already mean is a is a, a socio-nature, it's a, it's a hybrid category. Um, and finally, I consider waste an easily and more um, concretely operationalizable concept, whether we treat it as a material, as an economic or a moral category, than nature. I mean, nature is just too abstract to really get at all the intricacies of production and consumption. And I think when we focus on concrete waste materials, we can do that. And I think we can, whoops, we can even do um, this uh, point out in concrete terms, this kind of bracketing that Jason Moore calls keeping expenses off the books. So I'm just going to very quickly go over my early work, some of you are familiar with. So in my earlier work, I identify this concept of waste regimes that I thought would replace the concept of the mode of production. And this is really talking about the economy from the perspective of waste, not from the perspective of um, value. Um, and I, in the history of 
uh, Hungary, I identified three waste regimes, the metallic, the efficiency, and the chemical regime. And I'm just gonna mention the first one and the last one. The metallical waste regime operated with a concept of waste that treated waste as something always beneficial, always positive, something that um, was always worthy of recuperating and reusing. I just want to mention another advantage of this is this gets us away from this reduction of state socialism to its ideology and actually shows how ideology itself has a certain material um, manifestation and you can see that very well in the metallic waste regime where the assumption was that basically all waste behave as metal scraps, meaning they can infinitely be recycled or reused or melted down. And if you leave them out in nature, they're not gonna hurt the environment, right? So they're basically inert. And in a way, a lot of the waste that they focused on in this early period were like metal, right? You had um, bottles, um, you had um, paper, textile, leather, bones, these are all kind of inert materials that you can um, recycle ad infinitum. Um, and uh, these are just some of the images with which the party mobilized people to collect and find reuses for these things, even feather. Um, and then of course, if you ever visited a former socialist country, you knew that, you know, that there was always a deposit on, on glasses. And just to signal how much uh, this uh, benevolent view of waste was embraced from below, you can still see images like this in Hungary where basically people took home a piece of metal scrap and they used it to build fences and garden gates. So the reasons why m this me metallic waste regime became dominant obviously had a lot to do with the things I mentioned, rapid industrialization, armament, the ruins of the war, the embargo over precious metals. But there's also this attitude that waste materials are free, right? So in a way, reuse was one way in which early state socialism tried to pursue cheap or free nature in its building uh, communism. And let's not forget that when you compel people to report how much waste they produced, when you compel enterprises to hand over their scraps and waste materials, then you're also extending the party surveillance over managers and over workers. Um, and as I mentioned, this deeply resonated with people's values and experiences. After all, many of these citizens lived through the deprivations of not one but two world wars. So let me then finally get to my case study that um, illustrates how this relational view of the capitalist scene might look like from the perspective of waste. Um, the case study here is one that I have written about, but never from this perspective. Um, this is a case study of a toxic uh, waste landfill in a little village where a Budapest uh, chemical company dumped it, its highly carcinogenic waste. Now, we don't ac actually have proof that the product that they dump was produced in the production of an intermediary of Agent Orange. For those of you who don't know Agent Orange, was this highly toxic defoliant that the US Army used in its jungle combat in Vietnam. And so it's highly ironic that, that of course a state socialist enterprise would be participating in producing Agent Orange. So how did that come about? The US Army contracted with the Budapest Chemical Works to produce this intermediary tetrachlorobenzene for the production of Agent Orange. Um, and you might ask why did the Austrian company in Linz do this? Well, one of the reasons is because it, this product had a very high byproduct ratio, meaning that for every ton of tetrachlorobenzene that you produce, you ended up with half a ton of highly toxic carcinogenic uh, chemical waste. 
and this is 1968. So in Austria, this was already creating problems in ways that it wasn't yet in Hungary. Of course, there were domestic and internal political motivations for taking up this contract. This is the time when socialist countries already start to look for export contracts with the West to earn hard currency. So what was interesting about this case is that state socialist um, uh, is that due to the metallic regime, but the, the Budapest Chemical Works was never given a permission to dump this waste, this huge amounts of waste, anywhere legally or in a professional manner, because in the metallic mindset, waste was something useful. And they kept telling the Budapest Chemical Works and its engineers, you know, I'm sure you'll find some reuse for this, for this waste. Of course, they never did. And so these drums started corroding, leaching into the groundwater, causing cancer clusters and the death of domestic um, animals. So basically, the Budapest Chemical Works was left alone um, with, its, um, with its waste. As we merge into capitalism or the capitalist scene, I would note a very interesting synergy between the chemical waste regime, which argues that waste is toxic, it's dangerous, rather than in the metallic regime where it was always something benevolent, um, where with the end of state socialism, um, of course, the state's demand for waste registration, its redistribution and prescriptions for reuse were seen as intervention into the otherwise, you know, autonomous market mechanisms. Um, and so this waste infrastructure was disassembled, uh, dis disassembled um, and then deregulation uh, followed. And dumping and incineration became privatized, which often meant a for-profit interest in feeding these end-of-pipe technologies rather than preventing waste generation and um, waste reuse. Um, in the Q&A, I can also talk about some of the negative effects of EU accession, which we all assumed would be overall positive, but that was not exactly the case. Um, so the recycling infrastructure collapses with the collapse of state socialism. A lot of disposable products are imported. Exclusive focus on end of pipe technologies rather than preventative environmental policies. And this is what I call the return to the West, to the past of the West, because Eastern Europe never had this type of regime, never had this consumerism and uh, ethos of disposability. So in conclusion, um, I would argue that state socialism's relationship with nature, its analysis, is not just about adding another color to narratives about the capitalist scene, which is what Jason Moore argues. Rather, I would argue that capitalism's pursuit of cheap nature didn't stop at the Iron Curtain. It didn't just extend to the colonies or former colonies, it also um, extended to um, Eastern Europe. Um, so the wrong question, and I hope we can get away from this, is whether the Great Acceleration um, would not have happened without the Soviet bloc, right? Instead, we have to apply this relational perspective when we don't look at the two blocks, the two types of economies in isolation but we look at them in relation, how they impacted each other, how they impacted how they used nature, what models of consumption they um, implemented. And therefore, we can also poke holes in its self-congratulatory um, pronouncements about the efficiency of market economies and its um, capacity for greening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this uh, enlightening, a bit depressing lecture. <laughs> um, so we have plenty of time for a discussion, and we have two people with microphones. So I think Professor Gila will handle the, the, the Q and A. Um, but when you do my so signal to her, we'll bring a microphone to you. And if you wouldn't mind saying your name and perhaps your department, since we have people from all over campus here today. Thank you.
Hello. Um, thank you so much for the talk. This is like a really fascinating overview of all of the work that you've done up until now. Um, my name is Dana Kornberg. I am a graduate student in the Department of Sociology, and I work on waste um, oh. in the contemporary context in India. And I was just wondering, I mean, it, it was really fascinating. I was thinking about, you know, throughout the talk, thinking about, you know, sort of like we've covered the first and second world, but then of course there's the entire post-colonial world that has, um, you know, other sets of issues that are, that are related to what you've been talking about. Um, but I wanted to ask you how, um, just to sort of extend what you presented us with today, and uh, it was really fascinating to see how like the metallic regime gets reappropriated in the contemporary era, um, like in terms of bottle collection and other kinds of systems for reuse and recycling, things that were maybe positive environmentally, like how do mm -hmm. you see that continuing to show up in post-socialist countries? Maybe you can give us some examples or um, talk through whether there are positive legacies of that regime mm -hmm. as well. Um, thank you for that question. Yeah, um, I mean, the problem is that when they dismantle this extensive waste infrastructure, which was granted run by the state and not according to market um, principles, then a lot of people that I interviewed actually said that they felt morally dirty, for example, by not being able to take back the bottles or by getting a plastic bag every time they went shopping. So at the, now I wish I had done more with that kind of, uh, that, that kind of sensation of um, moral I don't know, turpitude of having to waste this much because it was so ingrained in us and I grew up in state socialism that, that, that you reuse everything, that you always take your bag, etc., etc. I would say that that ethos was very successfully dismantled in the first 10 years. So that by the time um, these European countries, including Hungary, accessed the European Union in 04, Romania, Bulgar Bulgaria in 07, they had to start from a blank slate as if state socialism and its attitude to waste recycling and reuse and waste prevention had never happened. And it's interesting because we see this with other aspects too. Johanna Bachman, for example, writes about how um, there were privatizations al already happening in uh, Hungary and Yugoslavia towards the end of state socialism, so before 89, but a lot of these were like employee ownership type of privatization, and this is not what was wanted, so they had to re etatize those companies, and then they had to privatize them. So it seems like whatever model, whatever um, little positive legacy that state socialism could have provided for building democracy and capitalism or whatever you want to call it, that was immediately discarded as tainted, as useless. Um, so I must say that not much of that attitude uh, remained. If I have time, I still have this idea that I'm going to carry out this project on contemporary practices of thriftiness. And what brought that up is actually the, the financial crisis, which uh, some people argue that brought back some of their own practices of saving materials, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm still kind of, I still have that pipe dream of, of doing that, that project. But it, it really disappeared. And now every recycling that we seem to have in place is attributed to the European Union. In fact, if you look at industrial recycling, late state socialism recycled more industrial waste than, than we do now. And I just want to emphasize this is my kind of mantra. Just remember that only 2 to 7% of all the waste that we produce in modern societies is consumer waste. The rest is produced in the sphere of production. Right? And look where our focus is policy-wise. It's all on what you do in your household. So that's another thing that I just wanted to put out there. Sorry for the long-winded uh, response. Hi, my name is Christian Capotescu. I'm a doctoral candidate in history. Um, and I taught a class on waste and trash here wow. a few years ago, so this is really interesting. Wow. I'm not an expert on this topic, 
but well, um, if you taught it, <laughs> <laughs> self-proclaimed one maybe. Yeah. Um, my question would be if you could expand a little bit on the post '89 period, mm -hmm. and what comes to mind is when I listen to your talk about sort of the outsourcing of waste. There are these very interesting examples of Germany, for instance, famously selling its nuclear waste to France. Mm -hmm. um, and then after 89, so I study Romania, there is this sort of onslaught of old cars, of dubious yes. medicine, of clothes that are being uh, sort of shipped by ordinary people from the West yes. to Romania, to the point that the Romanian government has to implement new rules uh, at the borders to sort of prevent sort of this dumping of waste in, in, in Romania. So it seems like there's this interesting, not liberatory mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. momentum, but actually the opposite mm -hmm. after 89. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that is indeed a fascinating development. Um, West Germany also exported some of its toxic waste to East Germany. And then even to, to this day, they say that it's very successful Grüner Punkt recycling project is because it ships the things that are very pricey to recycle within Germany to China and other um, places. Um, it is true indeed, and I think there's this really interesting with the, the kind of um, phenomena that you described. There's this importation of used cars to Eastern Europe. There's also the importation of or smuggling of used um, household appliances, washing machines, refrigerators. And the fascinating thing is that what drives this from the West is actually environmental in nature, right? So right now they're phasing out diesel cars in Germany. In Hungary now you can get very cheaply these diesel cars that are only one or two years old, right? So it's cheaper than if you bought a new car in Eastern Europe. Right. What drives it from Eastern Europe is, of course, the need to engage in consumerism and have the, the, all the semblance and the trappings of what it means to be European consumer citizen. Right. Uh, the same with appliances. They're facing out um, energy inefficient refrigerators. Those then make their way to Eastern Europe where they don't have those standards yet. And that was one of the aspects of the post-89 period, which is what you're asking about, that the European Union gave derogation to the new member states, especially in areas of environmental regulation, product standards, and sewage treatment. So they don't, for 15 years, they didn't have to meet all those standards that the West European member states had to. Um, and whenever they phase in these new product standards, there's also a kind of a delay allowed um, for the East European member states. So these are the things that um, drive it. I would also mention the ethnic component. I'm sure it's true in Romania that what I observed in Hungary, that most of this importation is done by the Roma. They bring in um, household appliances, disassemble them and sell them for parts or refurbish them and sell them as whole. So that's a very interesting division of labor and of course, you know, just bring in <laughs> Mary Douglas with, you know, matter out of place, how that's handled by people that are also considered to be dirty. So just put that out there as an interesting aspect of this phenomenon. If you could say a little more about your upcoming book. Yeah, so this is an anthology um, that came out of the conference that Alexa Yulchak organized at UC Berkeley. And he was supposed to write for us, and then he was too late anyway. Um, but he was the one who opened the conference with this idea of why do we constantly compare the West and East through this very narrow lens of consumption and standards of living, which is all about the individual tangible stuff that you get, 
What about the extracurricular things that we provided to children with? The chess clubs, the music education, the cheap culture, the cheap vacation, right? So he, he tries to broaden the concept of consumption exactly to balance this very unfair um, uh, comparison. And um, we have chapters, Brian's not here. Brian's, yeah, Brian Porter Such has a, has a I mean, basically, all the contributors are, are uh, from the conference, Mary Neuberger. And um, we have a chapter on individual consumer goods, such as, for example, oranges in the GDR, um, which is interesting how that changes from a luxury good to a basic commodity because of vitamin C that children need in the winter, right? Um, we have a chapter on VCRs in Poland, where the Polish Communist Party did not want to waste all its hard currency on importing Western VCRs, so it started to produce its own VCRs with predictable results, but that's a very interesting chapter too. Um, uh, then we have um, uh, Mary Neuberger on, on tobacco. Uh, that is another thing that you would think is a luxury good, but it was very much built into the consumer goods basket in state socialism, just like coffee. Um, and then um, my former student, Diana Mincita, and I wrote about this concept of prosumption. Prosumerism is this concept that emerged in the 1960s, um, this idea that um, consumers also have to engage in production. And this is something that, that if you're an environmentally conscious consumer, you do now in the sense that you are the one who goes out of his or her way to find where you want to source your consumer good. There's also the maker movement, right? So today we think of this as a progressive suturing of production and consumption. And what Diana and I point to through historical examples from Hungary and Lithuania is that this is basically what socialist era consumption was about that because of the shortages, because of all these issues with quality and ingredient replacement, people actually had to always tweak what they bought. And we argue, maybe this sounds a little bit utopian or romanticizing, that this created less of an alienated experience in consumption than what you know neo-Marxists or the Frankfurt School identifies. So that's, that's it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have a question about uh, social movements or mobilization for greater, you know, mm -hmm. better environmental policies. I mean, Poland is getting pretty big in cities like Krakow or Warsaw against smog, for example, mm -hmm. where people demonstrate with gas masks yes. in the streets, etc. So I was wondering if in, in Hungary you've had like a level of pushback you know, uh, against the government uh, or requests or demands for better environmental policies. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you've been talking about with the Agent Orange and the way, I mean, this is like very significant health, it is a public health issue. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if, what the go if, if, if there's mobilization from society, from social movements and organizations and, and whether the government is responding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very important, and I didn't talk about environmental movements. Ironically so, because I also was part of this Danube movement in, at the end of the 80s that actually many um, social scientists credit with the fall of communism, which is a big dam on the, on the Danube, on the border of then Czechoslovakia and, and Hungary. And towards the end of the 80s, not just in Hungary, but in, in Bulgaria, the Soviet Union, as well, the environment was considered to be a somewhat safe political issue. So a lot of the criticism of the regime um, could be made through this relatively safe framing of environmental problems. Um, and it became a kind of a Trojan horse where a lot of, in fact, after 89, a lot of the former environmental activists left the movement and became liberal um, parliamentary members or politicians. So that's also an aspect of this synergy that I pointed to the, between the chemical regime and capitalism. Now, after 89, a lot of the environmental movement lost its initial energy exactly because of um, 
participation and uh, and parliamentary democracy, and of course there was also this um, false illusion that now we transition into democracy and capitalism, all those environmental problems will be automatically solved. So that had a kind of pacificational, pacificatory effect. Um, and of course that didn't come true. In fact, there was this Wild West period where regulation was cut back, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there, were, there were always environmental uh, mobilizations, but they were primarily around local issues such as this um, landfill and plant incinerator in Gari. There were other local cases. And then as the Western or transnational environmental organizations like Greenpeace um, came in, that's when these things, so Greenpeace right now is the only one that talks about what they call the hidden um, toxic landscapes of, of uh, state socialism. I, it, it's, what's really interesting is that with this right-wing government that if, if I may speak for one more minute about, about this, um, is that they appropriated a lot of the, the criticism that some of us made in the early 90s against Western environmental discourse. That try to import, just like with Western feminism, some of the concerns around wilderness and other aspects that were not really the main issue of Eastern European environmental activists. And it seems like now the right-wing government expropriates this initial criticism of the EU and Western environmentalism. And if you remember, Hungary and Poland decided not to sign the EU's um, treaty on, uh, or uh, policy on global climate change. Actually, they said that Orban did this to save the Polish coal mines, right? Because if you if you phase in this EU level um, uh, carbon reductions, then of course it's going to be so much more expensive for the coal mines to produce, and some of them might not make it. So it's, it's, it's really fascinating to see how environmentalism has lost its appeal. There are young people now, um, like high school students, who inspired by Greta, I forgot her last name, you know, this, Swedish. yeah, the Swedish activist who travels all around the world. Um, and of course, Orban said that, yeah, the, these young people are paid by Shorosh. So, I don't know where to even start or end, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Adria. I'm uh, Adrian Devanka, anthropology. Yeah. I work with uh, uh, precarious workers in, uh, in Romania. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, the perhaps side effects of EU poli policies regarding recycling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and how this may have impacted not necessarily an overproduction of waste, but rather an overmobility of, uh, mm. of waste. So right before uh, coming to your talk, I read an article that mm, mentioned um, recycling facilities being built in Romania because of the availability of EU funding for this. Yes. And then not having the proper recyclable waste to actually process. So in order to meet the targets, they had to import waste and so on, which seems uh, to be t to, to go really ag against the, the purpose. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly right. But that's what happened with these toxic waste incinerators as well. The EU prescribed that there has to be a professional legal landfill within, I don't know, a certain distance from every uh, major settlement. And of course, that meant that there were suddenly a lot more of these uh, landfills and incinerators. And in order to run them, to make them profitable, of course, they had to bring in um, toxic waste. Um, so it's happening not just with, uh, with recyclables. But I think your case points exactly to the importance of what I refer to, this, this, uh, in the focus on materiality, right? That if you don't take into consideration the actual material compositions of these of, of, of these um, wastes and the recyclates that come out of the process, you know, it's, it's really <laughs> just, just, just useless, right? Um, 
the mobility of waste, now it's, it's really interesting and that's another thing that I, um, that I have against a kind of world system perspective that you would assume just from a very stereotypical view of world system perspective that waste only travels from the core towards the semi-periphery or uh, periphery and that's not exactly the case. I mean even Hungary when they were trying to find a place for this um, tetrachlorobenzene they dumped it in the Black Sea so it went through Romania, right? Um, and we actually send our nuclear waste to Russia, right? So I think waste travels in all sorts of directions and I think again if we bring the attention down to the level of the concrete I think we can better understand these, uh, these uh, complex uh, relationships. Um, <laughs> Something else about recycling. Yeah, so that, that really bugs me, this plastic uh, recycling, right? I mean, before, communi before communism collapsed, we hardly had anything in plastics. In fact, our plastic bags were so valuable that we constantly washed them, had them around, right? I mean, they were all like fetish stature. And then you do away with uh, the deposits, you bring in the single-use plastics, and then in comes the EU 10 years later and says, what you guys are doing is so environmentally disastrous. Not minding that the reason why they had to dismantle that earlier system was exactly to meet the Copenhagen criteria of getting the state out of the business of the market. So it really, oh, you can tell, I'm really <laughs> angry about this. And I think this, this is that, the anger that I think the new right wing also puts his finger on, right? We're so tired of the West telling us how to be good environmentalists, how to be good Democrats, right? But then it goes into this other extreme, not to democratizing, but to, you know, this extreme like ethnicizing uh, these conflicts, which are very dangerous, as you can well imagine. Question, the last one, perhaps? Yeah. Well, you won't be safe. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Jen Triplett. I'm a PhD candidate in the sociology department. And I'm interested about the relationship between ideology and pragmatism and habit. And I think that's come up in a couple of the, the responses to questions that you've given. And so I'm curious if, I don't know that I'm asking for a percentage or something, but to what extent is, are these moral values of conservation and thriftiness and ingenuity, which comes up in the Cuban case a lot, of the, this ingenuity is a, port of na a point of national pride at this point, it's part of Cub mm -hmm. Cubanness is to be yeah. inventive. Um, to what extent are those traits or values attributable to the socialist ideology or to the pragmatism resulting from the relationship between capitalist and socialist states or the juxtaposition of a socialist ideology against the capitalist one? Hmm. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I think those things are in a very interesting dialogue, right? I mean, the Communist Party has always emphasized the ingenuity of workers and the idea, like with the Stahanovite movement, the idea that if you just put your mind to it, you can produce more. If you just put your mind to it, you can reuse even toxic chemical waste. But I think those always work in intention and in dialogue with, with um, the necessities, right? So the shortage, when you have things in shortage, then of course you're gonna be more creative in how much you use of a certain material, how you can replace it, etc. So I, I, I see these as, as coming together, which I think is, is sort of what you're already implying in your question, that they both are important, and I think that's that's a very good illustration of how we have to get away from either just an ideological or just a political economy type of approach and focus on practices. And these practices are important not because I'm fetishizing the micro and the concrete, but because they can have generative capacity 
for the actual nature of that social system, for the actual economic system, right? So not everything is decided ahead of time, high on top, but a lot of the things that people do as a result of this ethos of ingenuity, as a result of the ideological belief in ingenuity, that creates practices which then have an effect on the actual nature of state socialism. So that's a very good question. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for opening this series. I think that even from the questions, we can see that this has a lot of you know, comparative purchase. And I'm especially grateful for actually the framing of the issue that provides you know, very interesting conceptual framework for us to think about for the rest of of the year mm -hmm. and for your examples on the Hungarian case. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. That.